We have been for some time dealing with a series on the word of reconciliation. So this morning I'm going to deviate from that and move it to this afternoon. Simply because I think it's good to interject this topic in the midst of the one on the word of reconciliation. Now, in reality, any Bible study we get engaged in is going to be presenting the word of reconciliation. Because the design of the whole Bible, when understood correctly, is to lead men to Christ, to reconcile lost men to their God. But it strikes me in this material age that we cannot say too much about spiritual things, beginning with the fact of our souls. I think you might be surprised when you look around about you and engage in discussions with people about religious matters and especially matters of spiritual nature and the soul of man, how many people have a crazy view of it or simply deny the existence of the soul of man. Now the word soul itself in the scriptures is a generic term. It can mean the inward man or the spirit of man. It can mean the heart of man, all three of those actually referring to the real you that dwells in this mortal body and will never cease to exist. That will be, as a faithful child of God, resurrected to have a body fitted for eternity that's as glorious as our Lord's. But the word soul can also mean, and is determined by the context where the word's found, the human body even, or the body and the soul, or the life force that we have and share in common with all biological life, even dogs and animals such as that. But we probably use the word soul more from the standpoint of spirit, the inward man, that part of us that goes on into eternity, the center of one's personality because the soul is a person and your person your soul will always be distinctively you separate and apart from all other human souls so I want us to think a little about uh, soul this morning what the Bible has to say about it from the standpoint of the value the value the worth of the human soul. Now everything we can perceive with our five senses, that is our, our sight and our uh, smelling and so forth, has to do with the material. That's going to end someday. When the body returns to the dust from whence it was made. If I am to understand the value of the real you and the real me, the soul, the spirit that indwells this body, the inward man, the heart, I must go to my Creator's Word to understand the value of a soul. So I would like for us to deal with that today. And I'd like for us to begin with the most familiar passage as our text Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. And when this lesson comes out, as far as um, radio or television or DVDs or however else it's recorded, and it can be very well in the middle of this study of the word of reconciliation, then realize that that word of reconciliation is aimed at the real you in this body. Aimed at your soul, your heart. And if I'm to appreciate God, Christ, the Bible, the gospel, that is the word of reconciliation, it will help for me to do that by understanding the value of the soul. In Mark 8, 36 and 37, the scripture reads, Our Lord speaking as Mark by inspiration recorded it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world 
and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now we've just finished going through a national holiday that's probably the best one we've got, almost, when it comes to emphasizing Thanksgiving. Jeff did a great job Wednesday night in showing about what real expression of appreciation for things actually is. But I wonder how many of us ever thought to say, Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for my soul. Now, a number of us have pets, and I do mean of the animal nature. And none of them have a soul. Not as I've defined it this morning as we're discussing it when we talk about the value of the soul. When they die, as we often say, when you're dead, you're like the little dog Rover. You're dead all over. And that means he's gone completely out of existence because he doesn't go beyond that. I know there was this all dogs go to heaven fantasy. And there are people who believe that there will be such things in the sweet by and by. No indication of the revelation of God about such things. Except to indicate that it's so radically different in the glorious realms of heaven. That things as they are now will not exist then. So much so that even marriage and the love of a husband and wife, wife of the husband, won't exist. For we'll be as the angels. There's no giving or taking of marriage in heaven. I think that does as much to me to show what a radical difference there will be in glory by and by as anything can in the Bible. Yet we know that it will be far, 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 far superior to anything here. And that's the place of the soul. The place of the inward man in its resurrected, glorified body. As John said, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him, speaking of the Christ in his resurrected and glorified body. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Look at the end of that question our Lord posed. His own soul. My soul belongs to me. And I can lose it. You ever lost something? Some of us don't lose it. We misplace it. <laughs> Whichever way we do it, we don't have it. But we don't want to lose our soul. Our Lord is trying to challenge the rational thinking mind that he made man to have and say, use this. Because the things material, such as we participated in so much over this national holiday, was usually centered around things of this world. I'm not saying we didn't thank God for our families, our jobs, and our health. It's all well and good, appropriate, scriptural. But how many of us day by day think of the invisible the abiding that will be here long after everything material has ceased to exist. <coughs> Too many times we live our lives as if all we have is what we can see and experience through our five senses. So this is my soul and I can lose it. And have I gained anything? The idea of profit is that you've gained. Even to the point of having the whole world, but I lose my soul. What will I give in exchange for my soul? Well, there are many people giving all sorts of things in order to have the material world that pertains to losing their soul. There are parallel passages to Mark 8, 36 and 37 and Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Luke 9, 25. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself? Well, my soul is myself. Have you ever thought of self without a soul? Most of the time we think of flesh, 
See, it all comes back to touchy. You ever seen the person, person that you call touchy-feely? <laughs> touchy-feely people many times don't think much about the spiritual. It's, it's the sensual, that which is perceived and understood through physical means. You, you won't understand that about the soul. If you're going to understand the soul, you'll have to go to the Creator who made it. The only way I know to go to that is to go to His Word. If you're going to understand what ought to be put first in your life, you'll have to go to the Word of God. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1, 27. Now people in the world just don't understand the value of the soul. Indeed, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, of course, Satan thinks that man will give anything for his physical life including his faith. Listen to Job 2 and verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. The sad part about that is it's true in most cases. When you threaten a man's physical life, if he doesn't do thus and so or give thus and so up, most of the time he will. And that's because he doesn't understand the value of the soul or spiritual things. So Satan's going to try to get you and me to believe that all's well. As long as all is well with our physical life. No matter what we have to do or compromise or give up in order to make us happy physically. So we must understand the value of our own soul. Above even our own physical life on earth. You know, Jesus readily gave up his life on earth to save our soul. Peter said concerning the persecution of Christians that Jesus had left us an example. We should follow in his steps. Look at the constancy of the spirit or the soul versus the temporality of the body. Now, I don't care what you do. You can exercise perfectly. You're going to die. You can eat perfectly, or in most cases, not eat perfectly. Hey, you're going to die. Yep, it's appointed unto man wants to die. That means healthy people, too. <laughs> that means those that ate all the stuff that tastes bad, but it was good for you. It means those that run five miles a day or... Whatever it is you're going to do that modern whatever says is good for you. And so you prolong your life to 100. <laughs> you're still going to die. And when you read of those folks in the Old Testament that live 500 years, 600 years, 700 years. Have you ever noticed what's said at the end of those little biographies? And he died. Something Satan gets a hold of us that if I can just keep this physical body so wonderful... For some reason or the other, 70, 80, 90, 100. Oh, let's just be, let's live a long time, 150 years. You know, we're hearing today that what is it? Um, 80 is the new 60. <laughs> well, people can get better. But you're still going to die. The soul is eternal, though. I like that. Think of how many people plan for their retirement, plan for this. Everything is planning in this life. And what's going to happen to this world at the end of time? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Paul said this to the church at Corinth, for which cause we faint not. We don't fall by the way. We don't stop. We don't faint. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man, the inward man is renewed day by day. 
Now, I don't care what kind of food you want to eat or what kind of exercise you want to, you can't, you won't have that. You cannot have that. For our light affliction, punished because you're serving God, persecuted for righteousness. Now watch how he viewed it, which is but for a moment. What does it do as we labor to be faithful to God through all kind of privation and persecution? Works for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. And how does that happen? While we look at the things, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. How do you look at something that you can't see? Well, he means you can't see it with physical sight. Isn't it wonderful that God's given us his word that allows us with the eye of faith to see what people without that knowledge can't see? That's one reason that faithful children of God and all that that means has very much of a one-upmanship over the world. I see things you don't see. And every faithful Christian should be able to see that. For the things which are seen are temporal, that is, with the eyeball. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Our life is temporal, life in the flesh. James 4 and verse 14, for what is your life? Have you ever asked yourself that question? That's a good question. What is your life? What have you done with your life? What's it worth to the Lord? What's it worth to the church? What's it worth to spreading the gospel, defending the faith? What is your life? Well, he's talking about physical life. He says it's, it's, it's like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Do you think most people think of their lives in that way? But the more you know of the Bible and live for the unseen according to your, creator, creatures, your creator's uh, direction, then the more you're going to see life the way you ought to see it. So to which should we give most attention? That which will be with us forever unending or that which is just a few short years? Well, in asking that question and emphasizing that point, just notice which one Jesus prefers that we give up when we must make a choice between the two. How far should we go? What sacrifice is demanded? How many limitations should we place on ourselves to be in harmony with the will of God, to live the Christian life? Well, listen how the Lord put it in the great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 29 through 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Now, you know that he's not saying literally chop your hand off or poke your eye out. <laughs> but he's saying if it was that, you should do it if it'll keep you from losing your soul. Well, it means then that he's talking about self-control. How far should you go in attaching yourself to this world? You should never attach yourself to anything of this present world. I do not care who it is. Wife, husband, children, mama and daddy, work, your friends, your cousins. None of them should hinder you from being obedient to God. And if they're going to hinder you from being obedient to God, what does the Lord say? Which is more valuable? That's the point. You know, really, he's talking about us learning to be good surgeons. What we need to remove from our lives that handicaps us and will cause us to lose our souls. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, the great writer teaches us concerning this contrast between the physical and the spiritual. 
And notice which one is far more valuable at the point of death. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. But yet look at the people around about us, too many members of the church who are building for the here and now. And as they build, the years rush by, and then they're at the end of their days. But they've lived for the here and now. They've made provision for the here and now, and not for the soul. The Christian's disposition of mind or attitude of rejoicing in the midst of persecution, persecution coming upon us because we're obedient to God, actually reflects the value that he places on his own soul above that of his own body. If we could get people taking care of their souls like they take care of their bodies, how much better most of us would be. And you say, well, yeah, but I know a lot of folks don't take care of their bodies. Well, that doesn't prove anything. That just proves they're out in two points. <laughs> They've lost their soul and their body. But look at all that's going on. Billions of dollars every year are sold on making yourself healthy. Go ahead and spend it. You'll die right along with me. Unless the Lord comes back first. Either way, the physical body's not going into heaven. Flesh and bones and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a Black Friday for spiritual things? How much would you spend on a Black Friday for a closer walk with God? You think there's any discount prices on that? In 2 Corinthians 12, 11 through 12, And he said unto me, concerning Paul's thorn in the flesh, nobody knows what that was, but Paul considered it to be a handicap. And yet, in praying three times about it, the Lord said, My grace, my favor is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I get rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now look at how crazy this man was. Therefore, I take pleasure. Now what do you think the Americans would put after that? I take pleasure in what? Here's what he said. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. But here's the key. For Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, I'm made strong. You see, nobody's ever been made strong by the gospel. They didn't, first of all, recognize I can't do this myself. I can't save myself. I can't be what God wants me to be in and of myself. I must know the will of God and put it into practice in my life. And I cannot let anything of this present world, not even my body stopped me from being obedient to the gospel. The soul is God's unique creation. The Bible teaches us that man is made in the image of God. His life begun by the very breath, if you please, of God himself. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Then in Genesis 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now it's important to understand that verse 7 of Genesis 2, which we just read, actually is talking about that which we share with all biological life. This same terminology, living soul, is described of all animals, the breath of life rather, the breath of life, is described of all animals that would be destroyed in the great flood. 
He's actually talking about the biological life we share. But the thing of it is, he took the soul which is made in his image and his moral likeness and he put it in a biological or a body that is biologically functioning like any other body. But we came a living soul, body and soul. And so it is that we have within our bodies that which God created to exist forever. Do you ever sit down and say, I will always exist? You see, we think too much about when the body dies. We don't watch out. We're just gone. And Jehovah's Witnesses teach such a thing because they believe the soul strictly is your body and there is no spirit. That all people who are not Jehovah's Witnesses, when they die, they just go out of existence. Then when God takes the earth and turns it back into, so their false doctrine says, turns it back into a Garden of Eden, then he'll only bring back those that uh, were Jehovah's Witnesses using their terminology. So there are even religions that don't teach the eternality of the soul. But that's contrary to God's will. The soul that we have is created by God to exist forever. None of us will ever cease to exist. All of us will exist somewhere as a center of personality. There's only two places to exist after this world is over, heaven and hell. The Bible makes it clear most people will live for the physical, thus they're going to be in hell. That's a sad thing. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there are that go in there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Now where are you today in your view of the soul and of the body? And which one ought to come first? God recognizes a soul at the time of conception. In Psalm 139, in verse 14, all the way through verse 16, he says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written. Just to throw in here, if that's not the genetic code, I don't know what it is. Which is continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. I wish people would realize that if folks really believed in the biblical doctrine of the soul, there wouldn't be any problem with destroying the idea of abortion. There wouldn't be a problem with the Supreme Court and knowing when a person became a person. But they reject the will of heaven and they choose their own way. And so guess where they're going to be when life is over. Psalm 82, 16, I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. We are gods in the sense that we are God's unique creation. And our soul gives us that uniqueness. We bear the imprint of God upon our soul. He's the father of our spirits, the writer of Hebrews says. Even our parents are the fathers of our physical bodies, our mother and father of our bodies. The cost of the soul proves its worth. Isaiah 59, 2, we learn that sin separates man's soul from God. That's why we're involved in this long study of the word of reconciliation. Isaiah 59, 2 reads, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. We learn that all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, which is described in Isaiah 59, 2. Our own iniquities, our own sins separate us from God. There must be a way that we can be brought back to God, reconciled to the one we offended by our sins. Again, I emphasize that only sin separates from God. You may not like gray suits. Well, you're not liking it doesn't mean it's sinful. Although I think some people bring sin down to that level. I don't like it. Not what I think it ought to be. Therefore, it's sinful. That man must repent. You know, Pharisees did a lot of that. <laughs> they did a lot of that. But it didn't work. The Lord collided with them over those very things. What is it that made it possible for man's soul to be bought? back from the dominion of sin. Paul dealt with that in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, when we rejected him, leaving him, kicking at him, denying his existence, fighting against him, doing as we please, Christ still loved us. God still loved us. And thus Christ came because he was sent to do what Christ could do and only he could do to save our souls. And by the way, in passing, what ethnicity is your soul? What is the national origin of your soul? What is the color of your soul? Seems to me when Christ died on the cross to save our souls, that wasn't even involved. What does that say about us? Whether you're a black man, a white man, and whatever various shades of white there are, brown or yellow as people say, and there are shades among all those. Christ died for all of them. But died for what? The soul. Because whatever color your body is, it's made from the dust, and in the dust it shall return. That will help us if we let it and believe in the Bible to be the Word of God, cause us then to hold a spiritual thing. What color is the resurrected body? Will there be any color in heaven? What is color? Are these things fit strictly for this world? Marriage is strictly for this world. It won't be in heaven. A lot of things fit for this world that are different than heaven. And you know one reason why? Because this world is the place to get ready for heaven. And it's perfect for what God made it to be. A place to get ready for eternity. And that's all it really is. And if you don't use it to get ready for eternity, you flunk the school of life. All these things are here. And the way we are, and the way he made us, the way the world functions, the way we deal with things, are all designed to say, will you put those things behind you? Because see, everyone has have a will to do or not do things. To be in subjection to my will. So there has to be some place to where we must make choices. To where we must choose what's good, better, best over that which is bad. The ultimate is serving God. And let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And that's the way you do it. To live on the level of the soul. Your inward man. The spiritual. There is no other way to live on the spiritual plane other than to take the disposition of mind that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey. And it's the same gospel for everybody. The power of God to save us from sin, save our souls, is in the gospel. And Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and salvation. To everyone that believeth, and is your first, also the Greek. Every person, regardless of the color of their skin or whatever, must hear and believe the same gospel. Because every one of us has a soul that has the imprint of God upon it. We're all rational creatures. We can take in the evidence. We can reason with it. We can know when it's correct. We can know when we make the right choice. And we can will to do God's will or to reject God's will. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 24, As much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vein, that is your pointless manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, made known, revealed in these last times for you. Will we not value our souls like God teaches us to value our souls? Quit making up our minds to suit ourselves to do as we please in the flesh as if we're always going to be just like we are. Can't we make... Choices based upon the teaching of the Bible as to wise choices and right choices. Can't we live on the plane of the spiritual? And we can. If we will, and there, as Shakespeare might say, is the rub. 
It's a lot easier to yield to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But our Lord said, if you would follow after him, let a man deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Living faithful to the Lord demands denying oneself as to our involvement in this present world. It means putting these things behind, making them secondary and subsidiary to the interest of our Lord, and seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And that comes down then to this. What will David Brown give in exchange for his soul? And you must ask that question of yourself. What are you doing right now? Is it emphasizing the soul or is it emphasizing the material? What takes most of your time? We have life abundantly in Christ. We need to then follow the teaching of our Lord in choosing the spiritual over the physical. Matthew 1, 24, 16, 24, and 25, then said Jesus to his disciples. And we'll close with this, although I've already alluded to it. But I emphasize it. For this is Christianity. This is being a Christian. This is living on the level of a soul. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But we add this to that. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And there it is. The way to live on the level of the soul or the way to live on the level of the physical body. The choice is up to us. And as we offer the invitation of our Lord to become a Christian this morning, that must be on a person's mind. It should be supremely and always on our minds. And choose you this day whom you will serve. Be like Joshua, saying, but it's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. If you need to obey the gospel, you must. With all your heart, believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If as a child of God you've lost sight of living on the level of the soul, and you're living too much on the level of the here and now, then we ask you to think of those things that are handicapping you and remove them from your lives by repentance and confession of sin, of those sins, and pray to God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon for the child of God that sins. So if you need to obey the gospel that you might be living on the soul's range and up on the soul's level, we invite you to do that now while we stand and sing.